nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on wavelength division multiplexing, and we're going to divide it into three components. Uh, the first will be the fundamental principles of WDM, or wavelength division multiplexing. And then second will be kind of the key hardware components that are necessary to create WDM network. And then finally, we'll talk about how uh, optical networks using WDM are kind of merged in together with uh, basically all the other uh, networking that we know, uh, such as packet-based networking and Ethernet. So on the first topic, just a brief recap, and this can be very short. Uh, remember in the first week we talked about uh, that there are different types of multiplexing schemes and that there are actually at least three different types that we identified. Uh, the one that we'll be mainly focused on today is called uh, essentially frequency division multiplexing or wavelength division multiplexing. And in this first case, basically you choose a set of distinct frequencies and then you send separate signals down each one of them. The other two approaches, basically time division multiplexing, the idea is that you have a time window for each uh, different signal. And so you can have up to n signals within each time window and then uh, you get a new time window every so often. Uh, and that's basically illustrated on the right. And then the third approach is basically co-division multiplexing. So that's somewhat analogous to TDM, but instead of just having a signal in a short time period, it's kind of spread out over some longer time period and they're interleaved in various ways. And we talked about that previously. However, uh, today we're just gonna focus on the first type of uh, frequency or wavelength division multiplexing, okay? So basically WDM and FDM are the same thing just to be clear, uh, but WDM is probably more common acronym nowadays. Um, and so you basically need to know what kind of wavelengths you can deal with, okay? And so this is just showing kind of the whole low loss range in the spectrum of uh, uh, dry optical fiber. So it actually extends from about 1260 nanometers all the way past 1600 nanometers. So each of these bands can contribute something to frequency division multiplexing. This is just showing kind of an old example where uh, when you had 100 gigahertz spacing between each channel and then you use the C or conventional band, then you can fit up to 40 channels within that range roughly. Um, and so, uh, of course, if you extend it to include other ranges outside of conventional, such as short, long, and ultra long, or even go back to the original uh, set of wavelengths, which was centered around 1300 nanometers, or an extended range that's between the two, then you can actually uh, encompass many more channels, okay, than just 40. The total bandwidth is really just the sum of the contribution in each of these individual channels. Typically, uh, these each channel would be basically fairly similar to the other channels, uh, in the communication wavelengths, and oftentimes there's also some kind of control uh, bandwidth, but we're not going to uh, focus on that today. But then the total bandwidth is just a sum of the contributions from each wavelength, right, which hopefully makes sense. And then, of course, the total number of channels available will depend strongly on the spacing. So obviously, the wider the spacing, the less number of channels you can fit into a given wavelength range. Um, and then the, another key measure of performance is called the spectral efficiency. So that's basically where you take uh, the bandwidth um, or the bit rate uh, of each, each channel and then you divide by the frequency spacing. Okay, so of course you want this to be maximum or best performance. Uh, when the book was written around 2000 or so originally, um, you know, this, this value was actually pretty low, oftentimes around 10%, but of course more recent systems are getting much higher, closer to about 80% plus. Uh, and that's before you use any other tricks in order to improve the performance further. So basically, uh, the reason why this non-trivial to get high spectral efficiency is because of crosstalk. So in other words, if you have channel A and channel B that are closely spaced, if 
any signals from A uh, feed into B because it's too wide in wavelength, then that's going to create a substantial amount of crosstalk or basically noise on top of your uh, otherwise desired signal. And so traditionally, basically the approach was to assume that channel spacing should be at least double the bandwidth of each channel. So basically that's written as delta nu greater than or equal to 2b. Um, so this, this implied uh, typically if your bandwidth or bit, bit rate was like on the order of like 50 uh, gigabits per second or so, then you need uh, channel spacing of at least 100 gigahertz. However, nowadays, I don't think anybody's really using that. I think uh, there was a move uh, relatively early on that happened over a decade ago uh, to move to dense wavelength division multiplexing by having this channel width to 50 gigahertz. And then it was halved again to 25 gigahertz. And this is still called DWDM. But now there's also this ultra uh, dense uh, wavelength division multiplexing, UDWDM, that's at 12 and a half gigahertz spacing, right? And so you can actually start squeezing these very close to each other. Uh, and of course, this is intended to improve performance. So just give you a rough idea of how this works practically. Um, the total wavelength range for DWDM is typically starting from this uh, C or conventional band, which goes about 1525, 1565 nanometers. The reason why this is so important is because that's where EDFA has the best amplification. But you can also go to the long wavelength band, 1570 to 1610 nanometers, which is right next to it, right? And you also have a, a, a relatively high gain in that region as well. So you can actually use both of these uh, channels. Um, but if you are able to take advantage of more advanced hardware and basically other amplifiers besides just uh, kind of standard EDFA, then you can also start including the O-band as well as like other ranges in between. And then you can potentially get this whole range from about 1260 to 1610 or even a little more. And so, uh, you can have anywhere basically a total uh, range of frequencies that goes from about 5 terahertz up to 50 terahertz or slightly more. And so then if you look at this table, this just showing number of channels based on the, uh, the channel spacing chosen. So for kind of a traditional uh, WDM of 50 gigahertz, you can see that you get about 80 channels in each of these narrow bands, but then you can get 800 over that whole range of low losses. And then it basically doubles as you go to dense wavelength division multiplexing, then doubles again for ultra dense, right? And so in the kind of best case scenario with ultra dense across the whole band, you get like about 3,200 channels, which is a good amount because each channel has a lot of bandwidth. So basically now I'm gonna talk about the hardware that goes into WDM. Okay, so there's actually a whole lot of components that you need in order to make a working uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing system. Okay, and so here I've just listed all the components that are needed, so it sounds like a lot, obviously, uh, but the good thing is that a lot of these components have overlap with each other, so it's not like you really need to understand like 20 different physical principles or concepts, but basically a lot of this is driven by uh, filters, right? And the reason is very simple because like since it's wavelength division multiplexing, you need to have wavelength selectivity. If you don't have wavelength selectivity, you can't really do much, much of this stuff. If you do have it, then that enables most of these items. There are a few items that are not wavelength selective, such as star couplers, but everything else is usually wavelength selective. So what do you need in a filter since that's like a really core component? Uh, of course, there are a lot of things that you want in tunable optical filter. So of course, tuning is the first thing and that's actually by itself non-trivial. Um, but then you also need uh, low crosstalk. So that means basically it's highly selective. So you're uh, tuning it to your wavelength, but it's not reflecting other wavelengths. And then you also want it to be fast you want it to be low loss, so in other words, not basically cause you to have to amplify the signal again. Um, you want it to be stable with respect to the environment, so in other words, if it gets hot, 
or cold or humid or dry, then you don't want it to screw up, basically. Um, and, and of course, on top of all that, you want it to be cheap. So <laughs> that's a lot to ask, obviously. But there are a few potential solutions. Uh, so uh, because this uh, time is limited, I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on some of these. But of course, I can answer any questions later. Uh, so basically, there are four major types that are well known. Um, and so the first is essentially Fabry-Perot cavity. Fabry-Perot cavity, the concept is very simple, which is you have two reflectors, and then you tune the spacing between those two reflectors. And then that actually tunes the resonant wavelengths in the system. And you can actually tune like a large number of channels if it's a large enough cavity. But of course, uh, you also need to be able to move the cavity precisely enough so you can select the wavelength you want in a reliable manner, right? So you need really uh, good mechanical control there. Um, but, th but of course, the dis disadvantage potentially is that high precision can be more expensive. And then the second disadvantage is if it's large mechanical object, it can take a while to move. So then oftentimes you want to use like micro mechanical devices or MEMS devices so it's fast enough to keep up with everything else. Okay, so that's one strategy. Second strategy that's, that's actually much faster potentially is the uh, Mach Zender interferometer. And so Mach Zender, of course, is basically just uh, analogous to Michelson interferometer or many other interferometers that uh, many people learn about in undergraduate uh, optics and so on. So basically, it's just like you have two arms, and then there's some sort of phase shift between those arms. And that's captured as basically a time uh, tau m here, right? And so basically, the concept is just that um, like your frequency nu times tau m, the delay, is basically setting a phase shift. And then that's creating like a transmission spectrum, or basically a series of peaks of certain wavelengths that are being highly transmitted. And so then that means that you can like send basically a broad band of wavelengths, but then it'll only transmit selected wavelengths, which is potentially very useful. So now you can also tune that by tuning tau sub m. And tau sub m can be tuned using a variety of techniques. Like you can use electro-optic materials that have a small phase shift uh, based on uh, the intensity of some uh, like excitation field. So that's one strategy. So that's essentially a cross-phase modulation. Or you can have self-phase modulation, so the signal itself tunes the tau sub m, right? Um, a third approach is actually use thermal tuning, so you basically just change the temperature slightly, and then as the temperature changes, the uh, the refractive index shifts slightly. Um, and then you can use liquid crystals and basically apply a voltage. Uh, so there, <laughs> there are basically millions of ways to potentially tune these uh, delays in mock sender. So this is a very flexible approach, actually. Um, third approach is basically using a Bragg grating, and as many people know, uh, Bragg gratings uh, just rely on the fact that if you have some sort of periodicity on the surface, then you can basically uh, have uh, selected wavelengths that will be diffracted into a different angle at the same wavelength. Um, and then basically this angle is controlled by the wavelength and the period of the grating. And so you can basically uh, tune the angle, and then you can basically tune the wavelength or vice versa, uh, you know, have a fixed angle and then tune the wavelength, right? So, so there are multiple strategies there for using Bragg gratings. Of course, one potential issue is that uh, sometimes they can be very sensitive, um, particularly if they're low cost, and so they don't necessarily last as long as some of the other approaches. And then another approach that's interesting is called acoustro-optic filter. And so basically the concept here is that you basically use sound waves to create some sort of like uh, standing wave uh, refractive index pattern in the medium. So then the sound is leading to uh, optical interference. And then basically it follows uh, a Bragg-like uh, expression in terms of the uh, diffracted uh, wavelengths which depend on kind of the index contrast induced by the sound times the periodicity that's induced by the sound wave, right? And so that depends on the sound wavelength, of course. Um, so of course, the, the catch here is that presumably neither delta N nor gamma A are um, extremely um, easy to control, but 
what's interesting is basically delta n is typically very small and then gamma a is very large. So then there are things you can play around with to actually get into the optical range as a product uh, for this lambda, right? So even if sound waves are 100 times or 1,000 times longer than optical light, after you multiply it by delta n and then maybe include a couple of factors of m, so m is greater than 1, maybe you can actually reflect wavelengths that you care about in optics around 1.55 microns. Okay, so those are basically the four types of tunable optical filters. Now, these can actually be applied uh, to doing all kinds of stuff. Okay, so the first option um, is basically apply mock sender interferometers just as an example to doing multiplexing. And so here, basically, the concept is just design a mock sender interferometer and all these little uh, kind of rounded squares represent uh, phase shift devices that are tunable. And then you basically try to couple two or more wavelengths into just a single direction on the opposite side of the mock sender. And so then you can actually create hierarchical patterns of these mock sender filters. And then you can basically now take all these different disparate wavelengths. So think of these as like different uh, homes in, in some network and then put them all into a single uh, wavelength and then you know, send that over a long distance uh, to somewhere else for communication. And so then the practical effect is if you combine this uh, multiplexer with a demultiplexer on the other side that has analogous function, now you can basically create pairs of conversations between uh, individual points on the left-hand side uh, before the multiplexer and then individual points on the right-hand side after the demultiplexer. And this is just a simple animation showing kind of schematically how you're doing this with just a single fiber. Okay, so that's really the key point here. Okay, um, so then uh, another thing that's also important for designing these networks, it's co very closely related, which is essentially an add drop multiplexer. And so if you go back to the previous thing, it's almost the same thing, except here you design it so that all the interferometers have equal delays, and that's called the resonant coupler. And then that resonant coupler actually forces you uh, to send uh, light out and drop it at a targeted wavelength. Of course, that could also then be tuned by basically changing all the phase delays at once in order to basically pull out individual uh, wavelengths. And then, you know, that can be done also using things like fiber brag gratings as well. So you can basically achieve the same thing of isolating particular wavelengths from one side uh, and the other. So if you want to use it as a local communication channel, you can do so. Okay, so then another uh, component that's important for these networks is called a star coupler. And so the way to think about star coupler is it's taking maybe like two or more inputs, and then it's actually outputting a whole bunch of equal outputs at the end. Okay, so then uh, it could be just basically a series of uh, two by two couplers that are kind of arranged in a certain pattern, or uh, sometimes you can use like what's called a fused biconical taper. And the idea is actually very simple conceptually, which is just that you have like a single, uh, uh, you have a single um, uh, pair of fibers that come into uh, basically a fuse, fusion region. And then in this fusion region, basically all the fibers get coupled together into a single large fiber. And then they kind of split off into kind of equally uh, distributed uh, uh, fibers on the other side. And so then this is particularly useful if you have like kind of just a small series of sources. Like here, we just assume two sources, A and B, but you have like a lot of uh, clients. Like if you're trying to distribute a video to a large number of clients, like everybody's watching the Super Bowl since that's coming up next week, right? So then that's what that's for. Um, so then the wavelength router is basically more advanced version of a star coupler. So basically the idea here, um, which is shown in this recent paper from Optics Express, is actually that you will take a whole bunch of different wavelengths from different sources, and then you're actually going to um, more or less uh, kind of divide them up in, in interesting ways. So for example, here you have uh, basically input lambda one and channel one, and then you have this uh, diamond 
uh, at lambda 2, and then you have this square at lambda 3, and then you have this triangle at lambda 4. So these are all from different uh, sources, but then you're rearranging it, so now all those different sources from different uh, inputs are now all coming out at the same output, okay? So you're basically like rearranging and, uh, you know, basically rerouting all the wavelengths to basically arbitrary targets, okay? And so you can see based, up, based on these uh, arrows that it becomes fairly complicated because like all the inputs from here are from all channels, all the inputs here are basically from all and so on and so forth, right? So all of these outputs have inputs from all the inputs, right? So it's not just a one-to-one -one mapping or even like just aggregating all the inputs, but you're creating like point-to-point -point connections that depend on wavelength, right? So this is complicated, right? So I'm not going to try to explain every last detail because I mean, frankly, this is a research problem. So that's why I cited the paper. But I would say that at least you can do this. Uh, one common approach is to use uh, like MEMS filters. And then the concept of the MEMS filters is that they can rearrange uh, the directions of each individual wavelengths and send them to different outputs. Uh, and of course, there are limits to this. Like you can't just do this like for n by n when n goes to infinity, but there are oftentimes like four by four and eight by eight type solutions. Um, and of course, depending on the wavelength, they could either be made out of silicon or uh, indium gallium arsenic phosphide on an indium phosphide substrate or a few other materials are possible. And then if we look at the concept of optical cross connects, you can kind of see that uh, the difference from what I was showing before is just that now you're making it more uh, general in the sense that now you can actually send in arbitrary wavelengths output arbitrary wavelengths at, you know, n number of channels. So again, it's n by n, but it's fully uh, tunable and incorporates the add drop uh, components as well. So it's really combining what we saw in the last thing with uh, dynamic tuning of the filters, as well as uh, uh, some other features like the add drop uh, feature. So, so then you really need MEMS mirrors to do something like this. Otherwise, it's not feasible usually. Another thing that's interesting is this concept of wavelength converters. And so really the concept is when you go back to that previous graph, we're kind of taking in like n different wavelengths and then outputting them in different locations. But what if uh, we needed to uh, send one of those wavelengths to multiple channels, but then we didn't have enough room in the original wavelength because we need to combine two different signals that were at the same wavelength. Now we need to actually change one of the wavelengths of a given signal. Okay, so so this is really needed for like large large area networks, uh, like uh, wide area networks, WANs, as they call them. Okay, and there, there are a number of ways to do this. The most straightforward way conceptually is basically you just absorb at that wavelength that it's at, and then you regenerate a new wavelength. Right. But of course, that creates a lot of overhead. So now there's been a big move to using semiconductor laser amplifiers. And so because of time constraints, I'm probably not going to explain all the details of how these work. But basically, a concept is that you can do a few different things with semiconductor laser amplifiers. But one approach is basically to do a so-called phase modulation. So you're taking your input signal and then you're basically trying to modulate the phase to kind of like push it into a slightly different wavelength, not like tremendously different, but enough uh, basically that it'll be basically taking that input signal as stimulated input, but then output at a slightly different shifted wavelength. Um, but then the most general or, or powerful approach in principle is four wave mixing, where basically you have like a pump wavelength and then you have your input data wavelength and then your output wavelength is set so that the input plus the output wavelengths equal twice the pump wavelength, or sorry, frequency, I should say. So input frequency, let me write that down. So input frequency, wi plus output frequency is equal to twice the pump frequency, right? And so the reason why this works is because uh, most materials have current nonlinearities, but then second, uh, this allows you to precisely uh, tune the output wavelength to be whatever you want it to be by just changing the pump wavelength. And it doesn't require uh, 
losing anything on the input, and it also provides a very wide range of wavelengths. So then this is really good if you need a lot of channels in the system. Uh, some of these other approaches, they're going to be limited in terms of the number, uh, the shift in wavelength that's going to really be feasible. Okay, so now, uh, next thing I wanted to talk about briefly is a WDM transmitter. And so here the concept is, uh, what kind of source do we need in order to generate all these different wavelengths? Okay, so of course there are a lot of strategies here, right? So I'm not going to be able to do it justice here, um, but uh, first of all, like if you have a laser, okay, um, you know, basically, uh, typically there's some sort of cavity. And as we learned when we talked about lasers previously, the cavity has certain resonances. And so if you choose the resonance to match the gain, then you have like a calibrated frequency, and then you can actually create several uh, uh, channels like that. So just to show you a very simple example. So let's say that laser one, basically we have, uh, let's say that this is our frequency spectrum. So we have basically three different uh, excitation modes here. And then basically this is our gain, and then this is our loss, okay? So that's our loss, that's our gain, okay? So then that means that we should be lasing at this particular frequency. Now if we basically take more or less the same materials, but we just change the length of the cavity, then we can potentially get emission happen here instead. And so we still have the same loss and we have the same, more or less the same gain spectrum, but now we have a peak that's slightly to the right. So basically slightly higher frequency. So then this uh, is basically our delta nu or basically the shift in frequency associated with uh, the two different lasers, right? So laser two has a shift of delta nu. And so if we just have a small number of channels, we can basically make each laser has its own frequency and it's well calibrated, right? So that's the easy solution in some sense, theoretically. Uh, but what happens if we have 80? What happens if we have 320 channels, right? We don't necessarily want 320 lasers on each side. Um, so then there are also, of course, uh, strategies to make essentially tunable lasers. And so tunable lasers can be done so basically you have either a tunable cavity or um, potentially other techniques like we use for tunable filters. We can also use them inside the laser system as well. Or the other approach is actually to do multi-mode. So rather than doing like this, we basically say, okay, now we're gonna have a whole bunch of narrowly spaced frequencies. So maybe this is a bigger cavity and we have a whole bunch of these modes and we pump up the gain a little bit. So now we actually have a whole series, maybe in this case about six lasing modes, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe even seven here in this case. So we can get seven or more uh, outputs from a single uh, laser. And we can of course do this in many different uh, configurations. Uh, nowadays it's very common to use arrayed waveguide gratings. And then basically a the concept of the arrayed Waveguide gratings is that basically the gratings are just creating a whole set of resonances that are, are fairly uh, sharply tuned and distinct from one another, but they're all like within the high gain region of the laser. So you get like a whole bunch of these outputs. And furthermore, because it's using arrayed waveguide gratings, uh, each of these outputs could be like from a different uh, physical output, or you can kind of combine them all into one output as you see fit. Okay, and then these can even potentially be tuned in that, in the sense of like moving the gratings to adjust like the direction of each output. Okay, but then if you really need a lot of wavelengths even beyond this, then there's another strategy which is called super continuum source. And super continuum is just like you take uh, the individual uh, laser excitation and then you uh, basically pulse it ultra fast. So then basically your output is becoming like essentially like white light CW output, right? So of course that's oversimplification, but basically the super continuum sources are very, very broad band, very bright and coherent output, right? So it's very interesting uh, toy to play with. 
Uh, only catch to my knowledge is that right now at least these are pretty expensive, so they're probably not uh, as commercially viable right now, but at least in principle they could be in the future. And now another thing that's very important is the receiver. And so basically, uh, once you have all your sources, of course, the receiver sounds like relatively trivial, but the problem is that if you are getting a whole bunch of wavelengths coming in at once, how do you know uh, what signal is which one, right? And so you need to have some way to deal with all the different wavelengths, right? And so one very simple strategy could be just have a, an array of detectors, let's say in a black box, okay? So let me make it really simple, right? Let's say that we have four wavelengths that we care about, okay? And then all our input wavelengths, so lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four, basically enter some cavity, right? And so then the idea is that actually maybe this detects lambda one, this detects lambda two, so these all have filters, so wavelength selected filters, and then you have lambda three here detected, and then finally you have lambda four. So you basically just bounce around this cavity until you've absorbed all the wavelengths. Okay, so conceptually it's very simple. You know, you just have a bunch of uh, uh, filtered detectors, and then each detector has like a very narrow bandpass filter. Right, and so if you know in advance like what wavelengths you're going to be using, then that's potentially a viable solution, and you don't necessarily lose that much light because if you design these filters correctly, they're like narrow narrow pass uh, dichroic filters. Then basically anything they don't absorb, they just reflect to the next detector, and it just keeps bouncing around because this is like uh, more or less uh, essentially like a cavity, right? So it's not intended to emit much light. It will only emit like uh, black body radiation, which is negligible in this context. Um, so more or less, uh, this is uh, a fairly straightforward problem compared to the previous ones. But nonetheless, you still need to be aware that in some cases you may have to be able to tune it. And so then if you have to tune it, it becomes a little more complicated. But again, you can use uh, wavelength grading arrays and, and other uh, techniques that are kind of analogous to what we were using on the transmitter side. Okay. So uh, any questions? Okay. So then the last like 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about how do you hybridize some of these uh, optical components into basically the internet as we know it. So the first step is basically to understand the difference between the DWDM hardware and then what's called the optical transport network. So basically the way that people usually think about optical transport network, and that was actually depicted on this last slide here, is basically a set of nodes. And then each of these nodes basically has like this whole set of hardware that's DWDM hardware, but it also has extra stuff that we didn't talk about yet that I'm going to explain to basically implement uh, the connection to the internet. And the topologies could be anything like what I showed earlier. So I showed basically like, you know, kind of a distributed point-to-point -point network. Um, and where it could be like a bus, could be more like a ring, or it could be like a hierarchical network, like we were talking about with the, the star connector. Okay, so nowadays, uh, like there's basically one kind of standard optical networking protocol called SONNET, which stands for Synchronous Optical Networking. Um, if you go to uh, Europe or other places, they basically have the same thing called SDH. Um, and so SONNET and SDH basically are pretty much dominating like the worldwide industry right now. But it's basically SONNET is the standard protocol to communicate bit streams over fiber optics. Okay, so then if you compare it to the previous uh, uh, approach, which is called Quisio Cronus uh, Digital Hierarchy, not only does it sound much better, but it also is much better technically because uh, it actually uses atomic clocks to synchronize all the nodes in the network and also is agnostic about the transport 
uh, communications protocol. Okay. So it's basically a transport protocol rather than a communications protocol. And the difference uh, effectively is transport protocol is telling you uh, basically how to sync up uh, sending data from point A to point B, but then the communications protocol tells you what to do if there are errors and how to fix that sort of thing. Okay, but I would say in general, SANA and SDH, which is very, very similar, are basically used everywhere nowadays. So, I mean, it's it's so successful, nobody even really cares about PDH. I just mention it more for historical reasons. So what is the topology basically in Sonnet? Um, so it's essentially, you have a multiplexer here, okay, and then basically uh, you feed the multiplexer into the Sonnet system, and then it sends it down some uh, fiber optic uh, line, which usually has regenerators built in, and then it goes to your terminal multiplexer. But you can see that basically it has like ways to connect in and out with like other networks that are uh, around, right? But this is in some sense like a very, very generic uh, topology, right? Like, I mean, this could basically be used as a building block for communication between, you know, any number of points. I mean, this is shown as a point to point, but you can also build it into these larger uh, arrays like either the bus or ring or star or what have you. Um, just to give you a brief idea of just like what kind of protocol is used for communication uh, practically. So there's essentially this uh, synchronous transport signal one protocol. And this is basically just showing you how uh, all these uh, envelopes are defined. And so basically you put all of your actual communication protocol and data inside of these payload capacity buckets. And then all this other information over here is basically overhead to ensure that you're sending each frame into the right place when you are supposed to, according to uh, the predetermined arrangement of the network. Okay, so just to clarify maybe a little bit, because I know it sounds very abstract probably at this point, like what is the difference between the optical transport network and Sonnet? So basically the optical transport network, in some sense, that's like the lower level representation of physical hardware, and that's synchronized with clients. Um, and it has fixed multiplexing strategies and fixed frame sizes. And it's not always very efficient. Um, it may have uh, error correction built in though. Sonnet, however, is a little different because it's very flexible because you can change the multiplexing and the frame rate, and you can also be more efficient with bandwidth. Uh, like the overhead is actually very small. I knew in that, picture it looked like it had a lot of overhead. But it's not quite as bad as it looks. Um, and also uh, it's fairly uh, well synchronized internally. So then you don't have uh, like packets arriving when they're unexpected, like too early or too late, which can cause a huge amount of problems as you can imagine. So basically the, the key takeaway is that OTN and Sonnet are, are kind of Serving different functions, SANA is much more abstract, OTN is much more tied into the hardware. Um, and so of course that's why it's much less flexible. And so SANA gives you that kind of software overlay of flexibility that was missing in just a pure hardware uh, implementation. So that's why it's so uh, beneficial to have that. Just to give you an example of how do you combine OTN and SANA in a real system, uh, this is the Internet 2. Uh, set up. So in case you haven't heard of this, this is how Purdue and many other universities connect to the internet. Um, this is actually a cooperation between uh, a ton of like higher ed institutions in the US as well as a few others. Um, and so you can see there are all these different nodes across the US and they have major connector sites um, which are very high bandwidth as well as these connections which are in red. Um, as well as uh, these dotted lines, which are kind of like slightly lower bandwidth connections. But you can see we're fortunate here in Indiana, we have very high, uh, you know, high bandwidth connector site, uh, which is essentially L3 connector. Uh, and that basically connects almost directly to uh, Missouri, St. Louis. Um, but then we also have uh, like a short hop connection to Ohio. We have connections to Pennsylvania over here, 
Uh, so there are a lot of connections, both locally and then, of course, like across the whole country, you can see everything basically connects together. So that's how uh, we can get high uh, bandwidth internet, even though we have like, you know, 40,000 students, <laughs> uh, because we have such a, a high bandwidth connection. Just to give you a rough idea, uh, like each of these uh, lines basically represents, you know, like hundreds of gigabits worth of uh, connection speed. And of course, the, the L2 and L3 connections are even much higher. So oftentimes you think of these as, you know, like very, very high bandwidth connections in general. And you can see that uh, the one that we have at Purdue, uh, it's the Indiana Gigapop. It's two 100 gigabit connections between Chicago and Indianapolis. And that's like the, uh, you know, basically what's keeping us uh, connected to the rest of the world. Um, and of course, this uh, is closer related to uh, how we connect to the internet, like through things like our computers and PAL3. Um, so at Purdue, uh, basically, we have PAL3, which is basically our Wi-Fi internet service. And of course, on top of that Wi-Fi service, we use a transport protocol, which is usually either TCP, IP, or it's UDP. And then we use specific applications like our web browser. But if we go down into kind of the hardware side of things, after we have the Wi-Fi, we have access to the network, which basically connects through uh, Ethernet frame relay into uh, ATM and then Sonnet network, which is running uh, on internet too, okay? Um, and then if we look at what is the overall architecture of the system, uh, this is a, a diagram that was provided by Dr. Graham from IU. And you can see basically we have our dense wavelength division multiplexing kind of at the foundation of the hardware side. Ho optical transport network that's basically built out of those components. And then we have Sonnet, which is basically giving us our flexibility for the structure. And then basically Sonnet is connecting to uh, physical uh, wide area networks that are built out of Ethernet and the like, which are up here. And then of course, Ethernet is connecting through internet protocol to everything else. So you can see that um, although you don't really interface with this DWDM hardware directly, this is at the foundation of almost all your internet access. But you can also see kind of how it's connecting. So you can basically see this upper region here, all the stuff in kind of this light uh, blue uh, color is like kind of the packet level. And then all this stuff down here, which is in pink, is kind of like on the optical level.